name is Dave Burns. I'm president of Midway Village Museum, and welcome uh, to our general patent, our dinner with General Patton tonight. General Patton. Now I'm going to go in and out of character because it's impossible to do something the whole evening in character. But if I was to be in character, I wouldn't be talking this way. You know, I want you to know that uh, being a general is pretty tough business. You know, that's not talk. He had such a high voice. You can go online on YouTube, and he has a speech um, that he gave uh, when he came back to sell bonds. And uh, part of it goes, Before arriving here, we flew over Germany, and it looked like hell from above. You know? And uh, so he, he knew his voice was very high, and when he got excited, it even went higher. And he was one of the best cursors you could ever want. The man knew profanity better than anybody else. And he could just rattle it off and you wouldn't even know you heard a curse word. And he would use he would use a curse word that had two syllables and he'd stick another curse word in it and he would finish with another curse word. And he did that among his soldiers because that got their attention. Uh, but yet he could sit down at a banquet like this and have all the manners that he needed and use the proper English and not use a single word that was out of place. It was a show that he did. He knew that he had to be this person to his soldiers and this person as a diplomat. And when you see the movie and they said that he wasn't um, politically inclined, don't you believe he played politics all the time? He didn't, however, get involved in the Democratic and Republican type politics. He never voted in his entire life because he felt like he was a professional soldier and he answered to the commanding chief no matter who it was. But as far as politics went, he knew how to play it. Um, so he was an interesting character. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the real Patton tonight. He's nothing like the movie. Um, the movie is a caricature of what people thought he might be like. Uh, it was made without half the staff participating because they wouldn't be involved in it, nor would the Patton family be involved in it because they were afraid it would be a hatchet job. Now later they came to understand that it was a good movie, and uh, George Patton's son actually uh, enjoyed the movie. He was there with his kids, and uh, one of the uh, Patton children uh, saw their dad began to tear up, and he realized that the fellow on the screen was actually related to, and his dad knew him, and it was his grandfather. So it was a, it's an interesting way that the family had had not understood how the public had thought about Patton because he was a very controversial figure in his life. Um, so he was born in 1885, November 11th. Now, does that bring it down, Pal, November 11th? And so uh, when he was a child, he always thought about being a soldier. That was something he wanted to be. Now, he grew up in California. And in California, there were quite a few veterans from the Civil War, and he had relatives that fought in the Civil War. He knew the Confederate General Mosby used to come by his house and talk with his dad, so he knew a lot of the Confederate generals and, a lot, and soldiers, and a lot of the Union generals and soldiers. So he grew up around real history. And he didn't go to school for a long time in his life. He was tutored at home. His family was well-to-do. And so it was not really necessary, but they knew that they were going to have to do something with him because all he thought about was being a soldier. Now let me set the times for you. Being a soldier back then was not an honored profession as we see it today. Uh, Patton would have talked about seeing signs, uh, especially in the West when he served, that said there would be no Indians, no dogs, and no soldiers, and in that order. So it was not an honor profession that he was going into. And so, but he wanted to be a soldier. He went to VMI, and then he got an appointment to West Point. And he worked at it. He, he graduated at about midpoint uh, in, in the upper part of um, West Point, and uh, had, uh, took five years, but he didn't do well in math. Some say he was dyslexic, but that's never been proven. But he didn't do well in math. But he excelled in all the other things that he, had, that he could. And uh, uh, his first time to represent the service of any notoriety is as if he was in the 1912 Stockholm uh, Olympics. It was held in Stockholm. He did quite well. And 
he, it is said that he could have won it. He was an expert pistol shot. But when they um, went ahead and tallied up the target, he had nine holes instead of ten, and they said that he missed. Well, that was before they put another target after, behind it after he shot. And today it's probably understood that he actually made such a big hole in the target that the last one went through and had didn't register. Had that happened, he'd have won a gold medal. But as it was, he didn't. And uh, so that was, he was an athlete. He enjoyed those kinds of things. Then he found the love of his life while he was in West Point. Her name was Beatrice Ayer. And uh, she was from a well-to-do family. And Frederick Ayer, her father, uh, was a land baron. He was a millionaire in his own right. And when he heard that she was dating a soldier, he just came unglued. But the family was well known. So sometimes you can't do anything about who your children fall in love with. So he figured he'd work on him to get him out, to, uh, out, of, out of being a soldier, you know, get him out of West Point, let him serve his time, and then he'll come over to the family business. That didn't happen, none of it. He says, I'm going to be a soldier, I'm going to be a general. And uh, that was his life. That was his dream. You know, we were talking here at the table. Wouldn't it have been great if you in your life could have done what you loved the most in life and get paid for it? Now, wouldn't that, if that would have happened? Well, Patton's entire being was about being a soldier. That's what he wanted to be. And when his parents passed away and her parents passed away, that left him well off, very well off. So he donated all of his pay to the old soldier's home and never took a dime from the government and worked off his own money. And he paid for tank uh, um, uh, history uh, development. He paid a man named Christie to help develop tanks. He bought parts out of his own pocket. He was a generous man. When um, uh, pay the army was bad, and during the 20s and 30s, the, it had gotten to the point that the um, army had been reduced and they would have soldiers literally destitute. And there would be a soldier or two that he would find out that had nothing, that were, just couldn't hardly make it, and he would arrange for his dog to get lost and arrange for them to find it with the reward that was attached because he knew that he did, they wouldn't want to accept charity had he done that for real. That was the kind of man that he wouldn't take credit for it, and he would deny it, and, and it was, wasn't well known. Now, that particular story that I just told you is in a book called The Button Box. And The Button Box was written by um, uh, Ruth Ellen Totten Patton. Ruth Ellen Patton Totten, I'm sorry. And that was one of Patton's daughters. She wrote it about her mother and what it was like to be in, uh, a child and, and her mother being married to, to, to Patton. And so as I go along and tell you about some of these things, I'll tell you the books that you can find it in and where you can go look it up yourself. So, and I'm not perfect, so should I err, you can go, and, and, and I'm not going to talk a long time as just a talking head. I'm going to stop here in a few minutes and let you ask all the questions that you want to ask as far as long as we have time for. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's how the man was. He wasn't quite what you thought he was. Now, I'll give you an idea of, of, of his thinking pattern. Um, when he was a young lieutenant, he... Um, was a, uh, in, the, in the horse cavalry, actually rode horses and taught how to ride. He was an extremely good rider. He was in polo teams. In fact, the Army pastime for the U.S. Cavalry in the Mountain Division was to play polo because it kept them uh, on their toes doing uh, uh, riding horses. And he came up with a saying, you've probably heard it before, do not take counsel of your fears. Have you heard that saying that Patton said? Let me tell you the story behind it. Uh, when you joined the cavalry, especially if you're not a very good rider, you had to learn how to really ride a horse. It wasn't just pleasure riding, it was serious riding. You had to do it full mounted with guns and sabers, and you had to do up countries and jump over things, and you had to learn the English style of riding with two bridles, and it was a complicated affair. Well, he had uh, his new recruits as a young lieutenant, he had them over the top of a of a hill, and they were to drive uh, to ride down this hill, and uh, actually cross a river and come back. They had never done that before, so he gave the order, and the sergeant uh, lined up the men. The bugler blew the call, and the horses came to was heading down the hill. Now these were remounted horses. The horses actually knew the bugle calls. Even the soldiers weren't real sure, but the horses knew what they meant, and they were with the horses. 
divorced, and then they were given this order. And if you if you think about a 45 degree uh, ride down a hill, you know that horse is, is leaning back, and you have to lean back. If you lean forward, you're going off. And before they got to the end of it, then they're going to cross this river, and the river is over the horses' heads, and then they're going to come back around and go back up the hill. And these men began to get jittery, and they scared him. You want me to do what? We're going to go with it. And there they went. They had no choice about the matter. Well, they got down, they got across, and they got back up. And he says, do not take counsel of your fears. Now, here's what this means. Before they'd ever done it, they were afraid to death. And the difference between that and having done it a few times is they now knew how to do it. And they were afraid of what they didn't know. And when you're afraid of something you don't know and you've never been there before, you become very afraid. And they were taking counsel of their fears before they ever learned what it was they needed to do. Once they were trained, once they knew what they were doing, they understood not to take counsel of their fears. And this type of thing carried over into much of their military training because they were aware that the more you knew about what you were doing, the better off you were. Kind of like in police work. You do it over and over and over again in policing until that you have a secondhand understanding. Like if you're in a car and you're going to be on a high speed chase, I'm talking to this guy, I'm paying attention to me. I happen to know he's a former chief of police. <laughs> and uh, so um, the, uh, uh, you get to where you can do it quite well. Have you ever gone someplace and all of a sudden you get there and you go, I don't remember getting there because you've been there so many times and you're thinking about something else. That was the kind of training that he wanted his men to do. He wanted them to be able to take a rifle apart, put it back together again quickly and blindfold it. He wanted them to know every single thing there was to know about their job because when the bullets start flying, they don't have time to figure out what it is they're doing. They better already know it. And that's the kind of training that Patton believed in. He became uh, uh, wanting to do the very best of what he can. So he, he went to... Um, uh, France, and he designed uh, what's them, he saw their saber, and he designed the saber. And to this day, the saber is called the Patton saber. And the enlisted man's saber is this one, it's a big old long job. And the uh, officer's saber is the same, only it had a metal sheath. And uh, the army adopted the saber, and he became the very first master of the saber. And he would teach how. Now, when I say saber, these are not ones that you fought with. These are on horses. And when you got a horse at a gallop, you brought it over and you stuck your target and you had a, a piece of leather around your wrist that would keep the saber from leaving your wrist. And then you could catch it again. And the idea was to catch him here in the sternum or somewhere thereabouts and knock him off the horse. And that was the way that the cavalry sabers and charges was to be done. And Patton was the uh, instigator of that. He was a modern man. He was not like the movie suggests that he was a man living in the past. He loved history. He read every single history book and military book he could get his hands on. So he knew history. But he was a modern person. He knew that warfare would change by the types of weapons that they used. But the men doing the fighting were always going to be the same. And so if he could get into their heads and do what it was that they did or was going to do, he could get ahead of them. He wanted to get in battle like any young soldier would want. He wanted to, to see what it was like. And at that, in 1915, uh, Mexico was having a revolution, and they were fighting for factions to see who would control um, Mexico. There was a bandit there uh, who was on one side or the other, named uh, Pancho Villa, and he decided to bring, trying to bring America into the war, he raided Columbus, New Mexico, one of the bases, he had about 400 and some odd uh, of his soldiers, and they were, they weren't soldiers like we consider them, that we would look at them as banditos, or non-trained or militia soldiers, but they could fight. And they went into Columbus, and there was a big fight, and they caught a lot of people off guard, some American soldiers were killed, and, uh, so uh, Pershing was given by President Wilson the uh, opportunity to go in and chase Villa into Mexico, and Patton wanted to get into there. So he kept after it until cause he, and he was ad, 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 brought in as an aide to General Pershing. And he 
he had, they'd been there a while, and he had information that uh, Poncho Villa, uh, one of his men, was at a, a hacienda farm there. And uh, so he took two cars. This is the first time that two motorized vehicles had ever been used. And he took some of his men, and they went up the side where they couldn't be seen on the, because on the hill, and they wouldn't be noticed by the dust or anything until he got to the very top. When he got to the top, there were some people, uh, some men, who were skinning a cow in front of the house. They just kept skinning the cow, but he saw somebody run in, and then there were some horses in the back, and these men began to get on the horses, and they went toward them, and they fired on Patton's men. Patton returned fire, and his men returned fire, and uh, he wounded one of the men and killed another one outright. Now, he had remembered from having been uh, with one of the t uh, sheriffs at the time, a man named Allison, who was well known at the period, you can find Western books about him, uh, that if you really want to stop somebody running from you, you shoot the horse, and they'll fall down and you shoot the man, you know, because you're <laughs> trying to shoot the horse, the man on the horse, it's not going to work, but you can hit the horse. So that's exactly what he did, and then he dispatched the, uh, the man on the ground. Um, he didn't realize that he had wounded the other man who was uh, one of uh, uh, Pancho Villa's um, lieutenants, uh, meaning that he was high up in the organization, he wasn't the rank of lieutenant. And so his, other, his men, he was in crossing the crossfire, and he was afraid he shot himself by his men, so he went behind the building with some of his other men, and uh, the man began to go, and his name will come to me in a minute, began to go to the side of a, of a uh, fence to get away, and acted like he was going to surrender and dropped his weapons down. And just as the men came up, he brought his weapon back up, and one of Patton's men shot him in the head. And that was the end of that. And so Patton, this was the first time they had any were close to being toward Pancho Villa's men. So Patton said, hmm. So he took two dead soldiers, and he put them across the touring cars. He got the saddle uh, as booty, and... Uh, he, toured, he took the, the, the soldiers that he just killed and brought them all the way to General Pershing's tent and dropped them out and say, hey, look what I did. And, and you would, by today's standards, that would be a little bit rough. What rank at that point? He was a lieutenant. And, uh, but what it did is it made the um, uh, papers, because the, the, the raids and the head found uh, Pancho Villa, things were not going well. And he was at least something they could point to that did go well. And that's when he got his first shot of ever being in the paper was in. And he put two notches on his single action revolver, uh, 1873 uh, humbuster pistol that he carried all the way through World War II. That's where the two notches came from. Um, President Roosevelt asked him some years later about that incident. He said, did it bother you to kill those two men? He said, no, but it did bother me to kill a horse. <laughs> and uh, uh, he was happy with, about his luck of having to be a soldier, and that's what he was there for. Wars are about killing, and they always have been. You keep killing the enemy to the enemy, you run out of the enemy, or they surrender. It's just that simple once the, all of the diplomacy is in it. If you're in a war, you fight the war to begin to win it. You don't fight it to come to a stalemate. So he served. Um, in World War I, as a tank, one of the first tank commanders, he had little Renault tanks, he was wounded there. Uh, he was shot in the backside, and it came out the front side, but he was still able to be a daddy, <laughs> but it was close. <laughs> and uh, years later, he was uh, at a party like this, and they questioned him being wounded, and he was angry at the people anyway, so he stood up on the table and showed them where his wound was. <laughs> that was a, he, he was kind of buoyant. Um, so uh, he uh, after the war, after World War One, uh, he he got several medals and, and uh, distinguished service medal, distinguished service cross, and uh, uh, he got a wound badge, which was a stripe on the World War One uniform. And later, when the Purple Heart came out, it was converted to wear a Purple Heart. The first one was a stripe in the uniform. So he was there during during. Uh, in between the wars, he uh, participated in as much training as he possibly could. He was assigned at one point to go to uh, Hawaii, and when he went to Hawaii, he had a scooter called the, the When and If, and he decided that he was going to take him and his family, and they were going to take a boat, his boat, from California to Hawaii, and he was working on using a sextant 
to go across and made it because that was a challenge to him. Anything that was a challenge to Pat, he wanted to accomplish. So he served there, um, served in, um, in between the wars with distinction and the Louisiana maneuver. He got the, the Hawaii trip is important because him and General Drum, who was his superior officer, got into a little bit. They were playing polo, Drum was, he was watching. And he was playing polo, and Patton was with his friend. Oh, you son of a bitch! I'll get you off, son of a bitch! Oh, God damn it, I'll get over here! And Drum heard that. And he stopped the polo match, and he summoned Patton up. He said, I'm going to have an officer use that kind of language. Stand down. And the polo people, a lot of them were fairly to do. And they said, if he's not playing, we ain't playing. <laughs> and Drum had to back down. So Drum and Patton didn't get along very well. During the Louisiana maneuver, Drum was in charge of one of the uh, defending forces, and Patton was with his mechanized group, and they captured Drum the first day in front of all the photographers and put him in a uh, stockade. And it was a result of that that Drum finally uh, was suggested it was time for him to retire. So uh, that's a little story that a lot of people don't know. Um, that story is, uh, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me on that, with that which book that is, uh, Patent Principles, okay? And that, that's, that story is outlined. It's not out in other ones, but it's in that one. Um, so when World War II came about, he was good friends with, with, with Marshall. He was also good friends with the Roosevelt's because he had been there at uh, Fort Myer, Virginia, and he knew that he'd been there stationed twice, and they knew what kind of a person he was, what kind of a commander he would be, and they were mustering out all of the older soldiers, and they were taking soldiers that young, who could be molded, who would fight for their general officer staff, but they kept Patton. Now, Patton's wife, it was no secret that Patton's wife loved to ride horses. And who did she ride horses with? About every other day, Amy Roosevelt. That helped. <laughs> you see, so he wasn't politically um, naive. He used his contacts to help the army. That was his job. So he, uh, his first action was in 1942, in World War II, o Operation Torch. And he was successful. In fact, he was so successful that even though Eisenhower had been picked to be the superior commander at that time, all of the, the, the winning went to Patton for the American side. And so Patton began to become a household name. And so he was picked to be a, a commander of an army, 7th Army, in Sicily, and he did quite well. So Patton then was in line to be one of the best battlefield, maybe a group, battle, an army group commander in World War II until the slapping incident, where he slapped two soldiers he believed were cowardice. Now, one of those soldiers, uh, later uh, said that it wasn't a good thing to happen, but you know it, it made him think he went back and fought. The other soldier was arrested, uh, according to Beatrice, that he was arrested during the Normandy invasion because he refused to get off the landing craft and was put in Leavenworth. You didn't know that story, did you? See, that's something I found out in my research. So um, he got his command in Third Army, and that's where he was the most successful. He was still flamboyant. He, you either liked him or you didn't like him, but you respected him. His speech that he had, uh, that you see in the movie, never occurred with all the medals and the stuff, and he wasn't a four-star general, and it did not start, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. That was added when they made the movie. General Gavin, who an Air Force general, had heard Patton say that in a private conversation. And they were talking about uh, soldiers not giving their life for their country. That's kind of, you know, make the other guy give it. Of course, they used the colorful language, no bastard to run a war by dying for a gun. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even make any other poor dumb bastard die for theirs. So they thought that would be a great way to start the speech. So when you see the beginning of the Patton movie, you see Patton wearing all the medals that he never wore in the speech, with the rank that he never had when he gave the speech, saying things that he didn't say. Other than that, it's accurate. It made for a good speech, and George C. Scott pulled it off very well. If it wasn't for that movie, you probably wouldn't know who Patton is. Because of the movie, people began to want to study, and Martin Blumenson wrote a, a 
multi-volume set called the patent papers. And he was the first person that the patent family ever let into all the patent papers. And he started from when patent first got started and went all the way through with diaries and papers and stuff like that. That's a lot of hard reading. And if you're not really into history, it's like reading Love and War. Yeah, you're going to be in there a while. I read it several times. I find it interesting because this is what I do, but it's a tough book to read. If you're looking for an overall book that's just kind of easy reading but thick, um, Patent Genius for War is a good book. Uh, the movie was made, was based off of Ladislaw Fergo's uh, uh, Triumph and, uh, or Dealing Triumph, and Bradley's book, A Soldier's Story. Now, Bradley was still in the service when he wrote The Soldier's Story, and later when he wrote The Soldier's Life, you see a whole different Bradley. Uh, so, so if you're going to read one and find out more of the, what really happened, read The Soldier's Life. Bradley is a little bit more candid about all the problems. Also, uh, Montgomery was considered a national hero at the time uh, in England that the movie came out, so they don't touch much with Bradley in the movie, but he was probably one of the worst field commanders that had ever had a field command and hadn't knew it. Um, uh, you also often hear about his dog, Willie. Now, here's one you didn't know. Did you know that William the Conqueror of the Dog was not named after William the Conqueror? No. Didn't know that. Let me tell you the story. It's a fun story. One of Pat's daughter, Ruth Allen, who wrote the button box, um, she was having her coming out party at 16. And so Pat, being the political man that he was, he invited all the young officers and the generals and the colonels to come have a big uh, barbecue. Now, because he was a man of means, he could go and have several cattle skinned and several pigs barbecued. Now, the best cooks in the Army at the time were black cooks. Uh, they were, that's where their, the Army was segregated. Uh, but they could cook, they could cook well, and Pat knew it. So it was during the Depression, and there was not much food to be had. So he asked all of the black cooks to bring their families and their kids, even though it was segregated and they were on the other side. They did all the cooking. So he's inspecting all of the, the, the trimmings, and he went around the corner, and there was a little black fella, little boy, one of the cook's sons, and he was doubled over. If you've ever gone and not eaten for a long time and you eat a big meal, you know how it can get to you. This kid had never had a meal like that. He was as full. He was doubled over. He says, oh, I'm little Willie Wimple. I'm so full, I'm as full as a tick. <laughs> and I didn't hear as full as a tick. So Patton remembered that. And Patton had always enjoyed English bull terriers. They had one named Tank, but it was bred too closely and it couldn't hear. And so they had a dog that couldn't hear, and you know, it, it could recognize the, uh, uh, the feet and recognize by look, but it couldn't hear. And so Patton always wanted to have an English bull terrier that was full-blooded and right. So when he got to England, uh, he asked Lady Lee, who was one of the British general's um, uh, wives, and Kay Summersby, who was General Eisenhower's driver and lover, um, if they would find him a real English Bull Terrier, a good one. And there was a uh, English RAF officer who had a little pup named Punch. And he had taken him up on the night flights during the raid to see the British bomb Germany at night. And he had taken it up to the little fella on the plane. But one night he decided not to take his beloved dog Punch up and he didn't come back. So the dog became an orphan. So Patton. I was presented with this dog named Punch, and he looked at it, and he was kind of scrawny, and he needed to be fed. And he says, I'm going to make you as full as a tick. And he remembered the little black boy, and he named him Willie Wimple, not William the Conqueror. And Willie was not a coward dog by any stretch of the imagination. He was not at the Mothersford incident where the little doggy barked, and he went back. Uh, had he been there, he would have eaten that dog. And in fact, he got in a fight with General Eisenhower's dog, little Scotty, and under the table in November of 1944, and they had to pull the tables loose, and there were several generals sitting at the table, including Eisenhower and Bradley, and they had to pull the two dog, two dogs apart. And Patton said, I'm sorry my dog got a hold of your dog. And Eisenhower said to him, well, this was his. He didn't know, you know, that they were fighting with territory. He says, no, your dog outranks my dog, so I'll send my dog to the brig. And then he said, but he sure got a good one on your dog, didn't he? <laughs> so 
that was a kind of, of, of joking. Now, Eisenhower and Patton were very good friends up to point. They had uh, trained in tanks together, and there's a, there's a book called um, Stories I Tell My Friends by Eisenhower. And in that, they said that one time they were taking a, they wanted to see if a machine gun shot for a long time, a water-cooled machine gun, would eventually cause the bullets to top them when it got hot. So they took a water-cooled machine gun, and they didn't put any water in it. And they shot it until it just became lady light cigarettes off of it. And uh, they went down uh, range to see if the bullets were in fact tumbling, if it was true. Well, they got down range, and the, bullet, the gun was so hot, it began cooking off rounds at them. And one of them went one way, and one of them went the other way, or we could have lost two of the commanders at the same time. And they came all the way back around and patted to the belt of the machine gun, turned it, and it jammed the gun. The other time that they got together, they took a tank apart, all the way down to the last nut, bolt, and screw, and put it back together again, and it ran. And that was, uh, the tanks were not going to be afforded by the Army. And Eisenhower went on his way, he later served uh, under uh, MacArthur and Patton, then went on to other places. But they were always friends, they had letters. And Eisenhower even told Patton one time, if you ever get a command, I'd like to be your second. See how things change? So uh, Patton actually made Eisenhower's reputation at first. When the slapping incident took place, it was obvious politically that it wasn't going to work, and so Patton was relegated down to command an army, and Bradley was put ahead of him as an army group commander. Now that was the first time we've ever had army groups. If you don't know what it is, it's like two or three armies grouped into one, and then the commander, we had three armies, and Bradley's army had first army, and third army, and he had ninth army for a little while, that went over to the British. And so you had groups of armies in Europe, Patton, Patton being the third army commander, it went further and faster than any other group when allowed to attack and had the most uh, battle, least battlefield casualties and, the, and most whatever conflict that he was in uh, that he was asked to fight and allowed to fight. So uh, it was during the Battle of the Bulge that he shone the greatest. Um, he had a man named Oscar Koch, who was his G2, Colonel Koch. And he had he'd known Colonel Koch since his second army days best intelligence officer in the Army. Koch took a running tally of all of the German troops that they ever had. He kept lists from everywhere. And as the Germans capitulated, or they were in Italy or wherever they were in North Africa, he kept a list. So they were planning what was called Operation T, and they were fixing to engage in it, and Oscar Koch went to uh, the general, he says, sir, he says, I have a list of all of the German units that are in our sector except one. There's a dark area over here. I have radio contact, and we've talked to all of the different uh, troops that have been captured in the area, but over here. And I'm missing this unit, this unit, this unit, this unit, commanded by this guy and this guy, and I know that the, this unit left Italy on, on railroad tracks, and then they're gone. And the silent area that we have is in the Ardennes area and it's completely radio silent, which is unheard of by the Germans. And I can't find these units. Sir, they had the capability of attacking if these units are there. And I think that's what they're capable of doing, is attacking in midwinter. Patton wrote all this up. He sent it to Bradley, he sent it to Montgomery, and he sent it to Eisenhower, and they ignored it. That was nine days before the Battle of the Bulge, and that's exactly where they attacked from. Figuring that he would be called on to do something about it, he began to make other plans in case he had to be involved. So he was called by Bradley to come to Verdun, and uh, they explained one to one that the Battle of the Bulge was going on, uh, and then Eisenhower came in, he said, I can attack with three divisions within 24 hours, and he was running the whole army uh, in the middle of winter, they traveled over 100 miles north and, and freezing cold and attacked. Now, something you may not be aware of, he was the ground commander for the entire Battle of the Bulge that lasted about a month. Montgomery never got involved in it, he didn't keep his troops in it, and Bradley was sacked by, um, in a nice way, he wasn't really sacked, but he was, he was kept out of it by I. The, the ground commanding general in the Battle of the Bulge was Pat, and that was kept out of the press 
because of the embarrassment. They were so bad when the Germans went through, they stole six B-17, fully operational, and flew them off to Germany. They also stole uh, P-51s and, P, uh, and uh, uh, P-47s. So a lot of the friendly fire that was later attributed to friendly fire, it's all kept secret, was not friendly fire. And they liked to never uh, ground it and, and blew up all the B-17s that the Germans had. Uh, so that is, is new information. The other new information I'll share with you, then we'll get into questions. Patton's army ran across the first concentration camps that they knew. They later found a bunch more, but the first one was in Orndorff. Now, he was ordered to Orndorff on April the 1st, 1945. Now, if he's ordered to Orndorff on the first, why was he ordered to Orndorff? And if they didn't know there was a concentration camp there, what in the world would you go there? Now, it was in the middle of the Thuringian region, which is a political subdivision in Germany, and that's where Hitler and all the Nazis came from. But why would you go there? Well, there had been intelligence reports that on the 12th of March, a huge bomb was set off there, and that near there. Now, Orndorff was a sub-camp of Buchenwald, which was a labor camp. So this was a labor camp. It wasn't a political concentration camp for the extermination, although they killed them uh, there too. Uh, and they were building underground everything there in preparation for Hitler moving his entire command and his political apparatus there. And they had another bomb that was set off on the 12th of March. The first bomb that was set off was so hot that it killed all the uh, laborers they had around it on purpose. They wanted to see what it would do. And the second, it also killed the SS guards who were around them, and, the, and it was so hot, the ammunition went off in the SS guards' uh, ammunition belts. Then later, nosebleeds and headaches were reported in the area. So Eisenhower ordered that to happen, to get Patton there, because he wanted there. And while uh, there, on the 12th, he told when he, when they, they, Pat, he went to visit the concentration camp and also the gold that was found right around that area. And he told Patton privately, and Patton was the first general on the air side, that he had given Berlin to uh, Stalin and that uh, they weren't going to take Berlin. And that he wanted Patton to head south from Orndorff into Czechoslovakia. And they wanted to capture as many secrets as they possibly could before the Russians got them, because all of that area was going to be a Russian uh, occupation and stayed there for that time. So there was good reason to go to Orndorf. It had nothing to do with the concentration camps. And a lot of the stuff that was found there is still secret today. So uh, there's another interesting point that you might not know. Now, now you know a little bit. I'm sure there's lots of questions. So this is where the fun comes. If I haven't covered something you're interested in, or there's something you wanted to know, I will answer your questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Yes, sir. So after the, uh, so after the war, Patton was assigned to Bavaria, southern Germany, an administrative job, right? Yes, sir. And there seems to be some controversy as to whether he died or was killed. I knew that question was going to come up. <laughs> your, your opinion based on your research. All right. My opinion. I'll give you the fact. I won't give you the opinion. He was not murdered. Period. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why. The accident occurred on the 9th of December. On the 10th of December, he was scheduled to leave and go back home. He didn't know he was going pheasant hunting that day. The night before, General Gay, who was his best friend and chief of staff, said, look, why don't you go pheasant hunting tomorrow? We go to Mannheim. We, there's some pheasant there. So he wanted to go hunting. His driver didn't know they were going. His driver's name was Horace Woodring. He was out partying that night. He gave wake up in the middle of the morning, uh, early in the morning, and was told they were going pheasant hunting. On the way there, they stopped two or three places to see places, people that they wanted to see, and they went to a castle. None of this was scheduled. Nobody knew his schedule, not even Pat. So they get to Mannheim. And there's a lot of construction around. And so they take and weave around areas because they're trying to get on the other side of Manhattan to go. That's enough. They come to a railroad crossing 
And on the other side of the crossing is a uh, supply depot. The driver's name, who was driving the truck, is not unknown. His name was Thompson. Okay? He's driving the truck. He has two buddies in the truck. He takes a left turn into the ordinance as they were going across the track. Pat was going less than 20 miles, 30 miles an hour. Pat was sitting in the back seat with half gate. He came forward. He hit the top of his head and it cut, cut his glass razor down to the bone. But when it did, it broke his spinal cord. It's like up on well shared. He had no movement. He could breathe. But after that, they moved on. It was heard by an MP unit who came immediately. There was an ambulance flag down. He was at the Heidelberg Hospital in less than 30 minutes after the accident. Before he left, he said, this is an accident for example. They're going to hang that guy who hit me, and they're probably going to try to hang the driver. You are not to treat this as anything but an accident. That's an order. Understand, at that time, he's the highest ranking general in the European theater. Uh, Eisenhower's at home. Bradley's at home. He's it. And verbal orders were followed. And if Pat gave you an order, you followed. But the guy did take notes. Right? He, took, he took notes, but there was no accident report filed. So they get there on the 9th of December, and he lingers until the 21st. Because he was a VIP, absolutely no one was allowed into his room except the doctors and a nurse. And later, uh, it was guarded by MPs on the front. It was guarded to 7th Army Area. It's the 130th Hospital in Heidelberg. I've been there. And uh, it had MPs all the way around it, and no one was allowed in. And uh, he, he lingered. They knew he was going to die. Colonel Sperling was brought in from the States to confer with the doctors that were there. They knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that, he, that it just wasn't going to, nobody survived accidents like that. But he kept lingering, and they had this hope that, he, that because there was a little twinge in his spinal cord, and they had this hope, maybe. They did not want him to die in Germany. He had, uh, so they put in plaster cast on him, and um, they were going to ship him over. His wife was reading to him every night, and on the 21st, she was reading to him, and he's getting sleepy. And uh, she decided to put up her book, and the nurse was there, and she began to walk down the hallway, and the nurse realized he wasn't breathing anymore, and passed away, and called him back. She was just out the door. This business about Russians trying to kill him, or this trying to kill him, was not unknown to Beatrice Patton. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. Do you know who Frederick Eyre was? Yes. Frederick Eyre Jr. was Beatrice's brother's son. Now, that didn't help him much. You know what his job was? He was the bureau chief for counterintelligence of the FBI in the European theater. So guess who she asked to investigate to see if he was really killed? So the story was settled until a guy named Batista, about 15, 20 years later, at an OSS meeting, stood up drunk and said that General Donovan had paid him $10,000 to kill Pat. Now, General Donovan, Donovan was head of the OSS, but... He was also Pat's friend, and he was a Medal of Honor winner from World War I. It just didn't match. So he kept with the story, and a, a, a movie came out called uh, The Brass, something or other, Brass Target, with that story where Pat was shot in the back with a, with a, with a bullet, bullet because the window was broken, and you know, and it, and it just didn't happen. See, he, he's one of my he's he's helped me along. All of these guys are historians. They can tell the story as good as I can because they studied the same stuff. And so, then, that's funny, okay? You have a conspiracy. You know, how many times have you heard who killed Kennedy, you know? And if you listen to uh, somebody's going to be killing somebody, or Bill, Bill Barani's going to be out of business. So, uh, that, uh, thank you. Um, so, you get, now that truck, that cake better be there when I get back. All right, so, uh, um, you, that's, I've asked that a lot. It just didn't happen. It's too incredible. Nobody knew anything about where he's going, including him. Well, writing books sort of gives you a It gives you an idea that maybe they might have, and the Russians, there were a lot of people that would, they, it just didn't happen. But if you're trying to make a lot of money, killing Patton's going to work out just fine for you. Now, when my books come out, I hope that works out even better for me, and I'll tell the truth. All right, next question, good question. I knew it was coming, though, I was ready. Yeah, I have mean, any other questions? Anything? Oh, yes, sir. As a young boy growing up in central Illinois, 
My father's best friend was a medical doctor. And he claimed, and I didn't know, I was not smart enough to know, still am not. He claimed that he was one of Patton's Jeep drivers, and all of his Jeep drivers were medical doctors. Do you know, can you comment on this? Totally false. Totally false. Sergeant Mims was his driver from the time they were in the States all the way through. Sergeant Mims left to go back to the States in May of 1945. They had another uh, driver that was assigned. There were drivers in the motor pool that would occasionally drive Patton. Uh, and then horse woodering uh, was assigned to him in the 15th Army. There were no medical doctors or any of that kind of garbage. There were two medical doctors that were assigned, to the, and one of them was Colonel Odom, O-D-O-M, o -D -O -M, who was his personal physician and a fine surgeon. And he was in charge of surgical for the Third Army, um, but there was that's that's a myth. Okay, it just didn't happen. Next question. Oh yes, yeah. ma'am. Uh, would you speak about the Panthers, the Black? The Black Panthers is the, the oh yeah, yes. Um, there was a group of Black soldiers that were in the States, Battalion of Tankers. And they were being trained and trained and trained and trained and trained, going around in circles. They were probably the best tra best trained takers in the service, and they were black. And people thought that they didn't have the capacity to be good takers because you had to be quick. It's the same thing with Skiggy Airmen, the same issue. But Pat needed soldiers, and Pat heard about it. He says, "There's a whole tank battalion. Send them," and they came. And he came up and he, been, he visited with them, and he said to say, he says, a lot of people think that black soldiers can't can't do tanks, and I know that people are going to say that to you, but damn it, you're in my army, and you're going to be the best soldiers around. I don't want to settle for half the day. I want you to go out there and fight. And uh, they did, and they were one of the highest uh, decorated group of tanking soldiers in World War II, 761st, I believe it is, isn't it? And they called them the Black Panthers. I've read the book. Anything had to do with Patton, I read. Now, I'll tell you about Patton and black people. You think he's probably, people have tried to paint him as, as a as a anti-Semitic or a, a person who was racist. Not true. During uh, in England, they had a race riot where several soldiers, uh, black soldiers, were arrested because they were not allowed into places that the regular soldiers would be allowed into at the same rank, and they rioted about it, and they were put in the stockade. And uh, you, there's a black general, his name will come to me in a minute, but he was the highest ranking general, black general, brigadier general, and he went to CPAT to talk to him. Not long after that, those soldiers were taken out of the stockade in England and brought to Pat. He says, if you'll fight, your records will be expunged. Just go and do your duty. And they were allowed in. Back, he figured that was a pretty good idea. So he asked, he asked the provost marshal, how many people we got arrested for little garbage stuff, you know, like not saluting and small death? It was about a thousand of them. I need the troops. Send them here. And he gave them the same deal. And they went out and they fought. He, he, he understood. Uh, I'll tell you a story since we're all adults. He understood that soldiers were going to be a little bit loose in their morals, maybe. And they went to Nancy, France, which was the first open city. And he didn't want to lose any soldiers to venereal disease. And that was a serious problem. So he sent all of his MPs to all the whorehouses and the brothels and places of irrepute. And he, he, he got to the madams and the pimps and whatever else they had run it. And a lot of them had been servicing the Germans too. And so he was worried about spies. And he said, look, you treat my soldiers decently. You charge this price for this, this price for that. He took, he took to all the liquor store owners and everything. You charge this price for this, this price for that. And if you and my MPs will be allowed to go into any of your rooms at any time, whatever going on. Then he told his soldiers, if you go to Nancy, you can go where you want to go, but I want you to use a GI-45. That's a black, okay? And uh, if you ever read the instructions to one of those things, you get out of the mood in a hurry. Uh, it's not like we use today. So uh, anyway, they were, they were issued these things. First thing they did. Now, what happened was, is Patton believed in Lee. But he was different. He allowed his soldiers to go into town fully armed. They would be given a leave, and they were taken from the front, and they would beg into a back area. And they had a huge tent set up, and they took their clothes off, and they put their weapons to one side, and their clothes were big, put in the pile. And 
but you've been wearing your uniform for three or four or five weeks, you know, it just kind of almost stood up on its own. And they got in the shower, then they were taken to the next tent, and they were, while their clothes were being cleaned, and they were reissued uniforms all the way to the tie. He believed in the tie. And they were issued uniforms, then they were fed, and then they had a choice of staying there with the club of beer girls and watch movies, or they could go into Nancy. And a lot of them chose to go into Nancy. And they put on their battle gear, their rifle, and their, their, their had a pistol that carried that, and they went into Nancy fully armed. He never had any problems with any of them. Nobody messed with them. That was unique. That was Pat. I visited, when I visited Heidelberg, the guy, one of the soldiers there, said, hey, you want to see something? I said, well, sure. That has to do with Pat. I said, sure. What are we going to go see? We're going to go see Pat's whorehouse. So I figured we'd go to Heidelberg to some dilapidated old building, and we got there, and there's the building. And I said, let's go and see it. He said, no, it's still in operation. <laughs> today. So uh, it, he wasn't approved and he wasn't, he understood. Now he didn't want his soldiers going out he, uh, and doing that, but he knew they were going to be soldiers and he did not want to lose the manpower for venereal disease or get them rolled in the back alleys and, or shot or get caught by uh, 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 spies because, uh, you know, even today uh, you, I get these young people say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to the strip joint and see if they got one of these girls. Of course, one of those girls happened to be working for the Bandito Motorcycle Gang or the Hells Angels or somebody, and they, they get it back in their pants on, the Hells Angel shows in, puts a pistol in, robs him. He's not going to say anything because he's married. So it still goes on today. So Pat knew that it went on then, and he made sure he protected his troops the very best he could. So that's another thing about Pat. He was no prude, but he was not a fool either. So uh, he had that. You didn't, you didn't hear that in history books, did you? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, he wanted to race to the Rhine and to leap to the Rhine. The, 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 the Rhine River was not leaping, but it was leaped upon. Uh, uh, William the Conqueror, when he went through there several centuries before, uh, crossed the Rhine, and before he crossed, he took a whiz in the, in the Rhine River, which was considered a, a total insult, and then he fell on the ground and picked up some dirt, you know, and claimed it. Well, Pat, knowing history, decided that if he could do that, he would do that. And he knew that Montgomery was trying to get across the Rhine. So one night late, they decided they were going to cross the Rhine. And they, they, they went at night, and they sent swimmers across. And they tied a rope, and they, they began to get where they put the barges across. And they, uh, he got across, and he, and he called Bradley that evening and said, I'm across. Said, You're across what? I'm across the Rhine. Ha, damn. But don't tell anybody yet. They wanted to get across, and he had very few casualties. So when Montgomery had invited Churchill, he was going to cross the Rhine first, and they had all the publicity up there, and Churchill was all up there, and they were ready to, to go across the Rhine. And so he said, uh, Patton crossed it last night. <laughs> oh, you could have, uh, Churchill was not happy, and, and Eisenhower secretly was thrilled, <laughs> and, but he couldn't say anything because of the politics. And so Patton got across the Rhine River, he dropped it, his, his uh, drop, way to drop a door, he dropped his zipper, and took a whiz while the camera was rolling. And then he went across, he just put the dirt down, and whap, and he said that for this, and that was the ultimate insult that he could do toward Germany. Is that, was that the story you wanted to hear? <laughs> Where is my voice? Uh, Fifth Infantry Division, he said. You know, if you keep this up, I'll keep going regular. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. I visited Bastogne, maybe about six years ago, and I was at the spot where Great Neighbors broke out of the woods. Uh -huh. There's a small black concrete structure there from World War I. Right. When did Pat actually get to Bastogne? Okay. Uh, this is the same Great Neighbors that went on to be a general's name. Uh, yeah, it was Christmas Eve. That, well, there was a small corridor there, and... Uh, the 4th Armored Division was headed at two combat battalions, and he personally commanded, and he switched one of the battalions to go one way and then one to go around the other way. I, I'd have to have a map to show you exactly. Uh, but there was a small corridor, and they got through there. But behind those tanks was 70 ambulances. And before those tanks was Colonel Odom that I mentioned, 
was in an L1. An L5, and an L1 was skittish. And when he landed with emergency medical equipment, the, there were many, many holes in the L5. And they put a glider in there with, with equipment. And the first thing they did was got them call him and ask him what they wanted him to do. And he said, we can set up triages here with all these ambulances. Don't do it. He said, we're back away from here. We don't know where we're attack because we're going to close the ring. And they got uh, quite a few soldiers out of there. Other part of the story people don't know. So uh, I have to see the map of the day. He said the 21st right by Christmas. Uh, that's pretty close. Uh, dates and times sometimes run together. This one right at the moment is running together for me. Is that, is that the date you had in mind? Yeah, Christmas? Yeah. The 101st said so they didn't need to be rescued, but I noticed in Bastogne there's this nice garden with a huge mosaic of pattern on the back wall. You see that? Yeah, I know of it. Uh, I was there, I visited Bastogne, so I went all through that. Uh, there's lots of stories, and the 101st was a very proud unit, and it took they didn't need to be rescued. But Pat, while he was there, I thought he'd do it anyway. Yeah. In Sicily, was Patton actually racing Montgomery? Oh, you know, that's, that's, that's let me tell you. Pat, Patton and Montgomery were not in charge of that battle. There was a British commander, whose name will come to me in a minute, British general. He ran the battle, and he knew exactly what Patton was doing, where he was going, but he had to clear the floor. I know it was, um, no, it wasn't Pennington either. It'll come to me in a minute, but... And so they cleared it, they cleared it. And, and, and he was a far better commander than, than Montgomery, but Churchill hated him, so that was the end of that. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but no, that, they, that, that's, and they did, there was the band, and they didn't go and he didn't get kissed, yeah. all that kind of stuff. That's a great movie, but it didn't happen. Yes? Can you give us some details on the Hamelberg raid? Did Patton plan and execute that to okay, the Hamelburg a, raid. a relative? Let me, let me explain to that. Uh, the Hamelburg raid had to do with uh, Patton's son-in-law, who was married to uh, Pat Waters, or no, John Waters, who was a colonel who was captured in North Africa. And he, Patton had word that there was a good chance that his son-in-law was at this concentration camp. So he decided to break away part of the 4th Army Division and send them to rescue him. And he didn't send enough troops. And they got uh, almost cut up before they got there because uh, the Germans thought the whole German army was coming. And uh, uh, his son-in-law uh, was one of the highest ranking officers there at the concentration camp, came out, and one of the German snipers shot his son-in-law in the backside. It seems that fat move, little folks. And uh, he, was laid in, he was laid in, and Patton got in a lot of trouble for it. So, no, he didn't get in a lot of trouble for it, but he got Oh, the first time also they're giving them my signal. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 that was when Patton asked if he ever made a mistake in the war. That was the one that he named, and uh, uh, almost all those men were either killed or captured. Most, a lot of them were killed and over rescuing. And the question is, did he know that his son-in-law was there? The answer is yes. It's not a maybe. He sent one of his aides to camp, Al Stiller. There to go. We don't send any camp to go, but Al Stiller knew his son-in-law by sight, and that's why he went. And his son-in-law told in the book of Randall Hamilton that yes, in fact, that, that he was there. So that answers that one. See, uh, a lot of these authors don't put in, or the movie tries to to train. Uh, the Hamilton Ray wasn't even in the Battle of the Bulls movie. The was the, the, the concentration camp of liberation. Okay, I've got to quit. If you want to buy the books, uh, they're there. Thirty dollars for cash and thirty-five. We got to do the little square thing. But that's new for us to do the square thing. So that may take a little while. And then we're going to go from here, and uh, we're going to go tour Patton's headquarters, his uh, command car, uh, the tent we brought that's got tons of stuff in it. And uh, before, as you walk out in these cases, because I was afraid. It would rain us out. You could at least see something. Um, I have patents. I, some of this stuff actually belong to Patton. I have a thermostat. Uh, a thermostat. His thermos and the, the leather case that he had. I have um, over here, I have his, his razor. I have the license plate that came off his Packard. I have a necklace that he gave to a uh, wrist necklace, wrist bracelet that he gave to a girl that, that did drive him. And I have a book that I gave him, uh, a prayer book, in 1943 to Pat. So those are the real deal, and they're here, so you kind of glance at it. And uh, I have pictures of 
patent here, but like I say, I was afraid it was going to get rained out, and I wanted you to see stuff you couldn't see. But now that you can see the stuff that you can see, we don't need the stuff you can't see. Am I double talking? <laughs>